the casual reader, it can be confusing. Underscore the word casual. Casual. The book of Romans is one of those books that you cannot casually read it as in a devotional type setting and really understand it. Romans is a book that you have to study. I, I seldom use this word, but I, I will tonight in this, in this regard. You have to go deep into the book of Romans in order to glean the real treasure of the book. We're going to look at, in just a moment, a passage from Romans that has dealt fits to all casual readers. But tonight I'm going to move you beyond the casual readerness. Okay? Let me begin reading at verse 6. We will try to set the stage. Pardon me, chapter 6. I meant chapter 6. We'll start with chapter 6. I'm kind of like Rush Limbaugh. I'm right 99.8% of the time. But from time to time, I, I do misquote things and give you wrong numbers. <laughs> I was thinking one time about asking Rush Limbaugh to come and speak to this congregation. Until I heard him say on one of his broadcasts he doesn't do personal appearances. Unless it's on a golf course. I would love to see that man saved. You think of, a, of a, the powerhouse he would be? I mean, he's... He's got the largest audience in talk radio in the United States. And for him to be on radio and giving glory to God, oh, wow. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> Let's begin in chapter 6 of the book of Romans. We're just kind of going to, kind of going to run through chapter 6, skim some of it, just to get a picture of where we're going in chapter 7. Of course, Paul is, is dealing with the sin issue. Not that any of us have to deal with that. But God love his heart, he had to tell somebody. What shall we say then? And this is in response to some previous teaching in chapter 5. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now Paul is the master of rhetorical questions. He asks questions that, every, that he knows everybody knows the answer. But he's just getting their attention. What shall we say then? Shall we... Continue in sin. Remember he said, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound it. Then why don't we just go ahead and sin so God's grace can be shown even more? That's a rhetorical question. I just read word, verse, verse 1. Paul, Paul said, God forbid. Whoa. Grab the reins. No, that's not going to work. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? I was going to say in it, but I didn't know if they had King James or New King James. How can we who are dead to sin live any longer in it? I remember many, many years ago, I believe I was in college, wasn't even married yet. Now that'll tell you how long ago it's been. Heard a preacher talking about this very issue, this very subject one time. 
And he said, when the devil comes to you and he begins to tempt you and you're really feeling drawn into that thing, remember to say this. A dead man can't sin. That, le that needs no explanation. A dead man can't sin. And if you are dead to sin, how can you sin? The Christian that sins is the Christian who is not dead to it. Now there's a difference, my friend, in sinning willfully and being coerced. <clears throat> now this is what I mean by that. Because we are still living with a carnal nature, and we'll get into this in just a moment, because we're still living in the carnal nature. In other words, we're living with the same characteristics that have been passed down since Adam. We are from time to time, and sometimes even too often, thrown into a situation that we had no making of, and we immediately revert from our new nature to our old sin nature. Let me give you an example. A person on the freeway or coming down Andrews Highway cuts you off. Your immediate response is not the new nature response. Oh God bless him. May he have a wonderful and blessed day. Your first response is the old nature response. You big dummy, why you do that? Now that's not necessarily a sin. Praise God. But it's tiptoeing around it very very closely. <laughs> I once said, a number of years ago, I said that my greatest temptations somehow revolve around automobiles. I'm not tempted to drink. I'm not tempted to smoke. I'm not tempted to cuss. I'm not, I'm not tempted to do narcotics. I'm not tempted to commit sexual sin or adultery and those kinds. I have, there's, the devil knows that's, you know, that's not even an issue with me. Those things are not issues. But when I get in a car, <laughs> I get in the driver's side and the devil gets in the passenger side and here we go. Hey. Honey, when I... gets in the passenger side. When I'm by myself in my pick em up in my cowboy Cadillac, I get in and then the devil gets in with me. And here we go. Now how many of you guys are tracking with me? Yeah. I have never understood why people, male or female, I, I don't pick on, you know, I'm, I'm not a sexist. When I, if, you're, if you're a dumb driver, you're a dumb driver. Doesn't matter on your sex. Okay? Of course, everyone in here are good drivers. I know that. I never can understand why people don't learn what 
feeders are for to the interstate. The feeder is designed to help you get your speed up, match with the interstate driver, so that you can smoothly. But it, ne it never fails. I'm ready to get on the interstate behind somebody doing 35 miles an hour. And I'm, I'm looking behind me. I'm going to get around that cat as soon as I possibly can. And sometimes I cross the white line. I'll admit that. <laughs> There's a policeman sitting over here. 35 miles an hour, and the people on the interstate are doing 80 plus. And I'm supposed to feed into that? My old character, my old nature rises to the surface. I'm behind my wheel yelling. I'm not honking my horn because I'm afraid they'll slow down. <laughs> No, they can't hear me. I'm, 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 I'm. Hurry up! Would you please step on the accelerator? These guys are going to run over us. Get over there! Get out of the way! Move over! Get out of my way! I'm yelling. The old carnal man jumps up. My carnal man revolves around vehicles. My carnal man jumps out. When I drive through a Walmart or a Walgreens or whatever parking lot, and I see somebody has changed their baby and left the diaper for somebody to pick up, my carnal man jumps up. You change your baby, you take it home. Carnal man. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin, and that's where I started with this thing. We are dead to sin, but our sin nature has not been annihilated. I heard, I heard a preacher the other day talking about our sin nature being annihilated. And I kept my silence. I didn't say anything. But I know better. If it were annihilated, I wouldn't have so much trouble. That's right. That's right. Annihilated means to be completely destroyed. Right. It's not there anymore. <laughs> but when I wake up, I don't have to do a thing. I don't have to be thinking bad thoughts. When I wake up in the morning, I'm just like you. i got bad breath. That's the old nature. Did you know in heaven you won't have bad breath? Don't you, don't you, how many of you ever stuck your nose down by the mouth of a newborn baby? They have the sweetest breath because that old sin nature hadn't started coming out yet. See, you don't have to sin to have the old sin nature. You just have it. So I am dead to sin, but the sin nature is not annihilated. Know ye not, verse 3, I didn't mean to stop there so long. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him, baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk. We also should, should, underscore that, we also should walk in the new life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man, that old carnal nature, is crucified with Him.
that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Paul deals a lot in the next couple chapters with death. And he uses metaphors and symbolism around death. And here it began. We are dead to sin and we are free from it. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once that in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, just like that, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Let not sin therefore reign. There's a key phrase here. Let not sin therefore reign. That means to control control you or to reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Now see, now there's my issue. When I get behind the wheel, my members want to be yielded to that old carnal nature. But yield yourselves unto God. Oh, by the way, I'm not as bad as I used to be. Sometimes I just take a deep breath and relax and go with the flow. Other, otherwise, my blood pressure gets up. It's not good for me. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive, in other words, resurrected, from the dead, because we're resurrected in Him, right? He died once, we die in Him, and we're resurrected in Him. And your members, yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. That is not a declarative sentence in itself. I know that there is a, a, a period after verse 13, but verse 14 is not a standalone declarative sentence. It is piggybacking on verse 13 about yielding your members, being dead to sin, right? And, al and alive, to be free from that thing, yielding your members to righteousness. And if you do so, if you yield your members unto God, unto righteous acts, sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but you are under grace. Aren't you glad for the grace of God? Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. He goes on and, and deals with this sin issue and the grace issue on through the chapter. Jump down to verse 24. When ye were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. <laughs> Strange terminology. When you were servants of sin, you were free. From righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Where are you? Where are Verse you? 21, chapter you 6. You said, yeah, you said 24. There's no yeah. Well, see, there's part of the 99. 90. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 24 is where I'm really headed in chapter 7, so oh, okay. it's in the back of my mind. So we're in verse 21 of chapter 6. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants of God, 
ye have fruit unto holiness, and the end is everlasting life. And then the famous quote that we all use, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Know ye not, brethren, See, this goes on. The thought continues through chapter 7. Well, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Don't you know? Know you not, brethren? For I speak to them that know the law, those Jews who were still under law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. Don't you know that? Yes, they did. Another rhetorical question. He knew they knew. If the law is in dominion over you and reigning over you, then you are subject to that law. For the woman, and here's the metaphor, the, sim the symbolism comes in, for the woman which hath the husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth, but if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. Now that stands alone. That's understandable, right? It's common sense. If he's dead, then she's no longer the wife. No longer under the husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. And if you follow the reasoning here, what he's doing, he's dealing with man and law, husband and bride. And he mixes the metaphor. Sometimes he speaks of us as the bride, as the woman, Sometimes he speaks to us as the husband. Okay. There you go. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. See? Here you're the husband. You've died. Wait for that to see again. Under, understand the symbolism he's using. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. What's that mean? Because you died in it. When you were buried with him, you accepted his death, his sacrificial death on the cross. He died, you're in Him, therefore, you're dead. You got it? That ye should be married to another. Here the symbolism gets really strange. That ye should be married to another, even to Him who is raised from the dead. Isn't that amazing? You died in Him, you're dead to the law, because Christ died, you died. But now you're re-wedded to the same person who died. Why? How does that be happen? Because he, res he was resurrected. He died, you died. He lives, you live. That we should bring forth fruit unto God. Verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. What shall we say then in regards to all this dying stuff and 
the law and our relationship to it. Now remember, he's, he's dealing with Jews who, uh, even, even uh, Messianic Jews who were still clinging to the law and felt that they had to obey the law and come under all the tenets of the law. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Did God create a sin? Absolutely not. See, here's another rhetorical question. Is the law sin? God forbid. No. I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. God is perfect. Would you agree with that? Amen. And everything He creates is perfect. Now, I, I know why you said well. Because we are looking through our natural eyes. My little sister, who is now in heaven for almost six years, was born Down syndrome. My sister commented when I went to the funeral and we, all the, the, us kids were gathered around and looking at pictures of my sister. My sister made this observation. Ken, there's not a picture. You never take a picture with Annie. That was my sister. You never took a picture with Annie unless you were holding her. In every picture, I had my arms around her. You'll never know how much I love that little girl. And I was not ashamed one whit at her mongoloidism. I look back now at, at, when I prayed for my sister's healing, and that's right to pray for the healing. It's only right. But I look back now, and I saw her through such imperfect eyes. And she was what God made her to be in the world. And she was perfect in His eyes. Don't try to figure that out. Don't go home and put the pencil to it and try to do all the equations. Make it work. Just accept it. God doesn't make junk. Everything He does is perfect. And the law was perfect. And it did exactly what He created it to do. Well, you say, well, Pastor, then, then how, how do we interpret the Scripture that uh, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is imperfect shall be done away? You're looking through man's eyes again. The law was perfect in everything that God wanted it to do. But there came a time when the law could not do what God wanted to do. That's right. That's right. It could lead men to, to understand sin, but it could not lead men into deliverance from sin. That's right. It was always pointing, and that's what He created it to do. Always point to the sin so that the Old Testament believer would always be going to God. Once a year, the priest would go in, blah, 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 blah. You know the whole story there. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No. I had not known sin. It was sin that made me understand that I was a sinner. The law for had... I, I had not known lust, I, but, but it was the law who said, don't covet. Therefore, if I do covet, that's lust. I would have never known that had the law never said, don't covet. So the law did what it was supposed to do. 
But sin, taking a case of the old na nature of man that passed down from Adam, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrote or wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. What you? Evil desire. For without the law, sin was dead. If you don't know, you're not responsible. If you know, you're responsible. So God sent the law so they would know. Now, they're responsible. They didn't know what sin was until the law said it was sin. And that's what it was said to do. Point out the sin. Right? For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Now you're beginning to understand why I said that the casual reader just can't dig on this. You have to study this out. Well, you say, well, that's why I have you, Pastor. Tell me what it means. Uh. Okay, let me go get a spoon. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. I'm dead. There's no hope. I'm dead. No way. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just, and good. It's perfect. God made it. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me, by that which is good, that sin by commandment might become exceeding sinful. I'm going to go to the Message Bible in just a moment, and it's it's. But I, I tore my Bible. How can that? Be? Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that might appear sin working death in me. Uh, that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know. He goes on. See, the thought goes on. For we know that the law is spiritual. It deals with spiritual things. But I am carnal. I was sold under sin. I was created in carnal man. Sold under sin. For that which I... Do I allow not? There's some interesting that which I do. I know the law of spiritual but I don't know what I'm doing. I do not understand. Okay. I don't approve of that. I mean, that's good. I'm saying. Okay, I y'all read that one, I'll read this one. For that which I do. I don't approve of it. In other words, my carnal man is always doing stuff that ain't right. Mm -hmm. How do I know it's not right? The law pointed it out. See, the law came into my life and sin revived. Where there is law, sin just goes rampant. The understanding of that sin. Well, that which I, I do, I, I, I don't approve of it. I don't allow it. Well, what I would, what I, I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate, that's what I do. If then, I do that which I would not. I consent unto the law that it is good. Why is it good? Because it's telling me that what I'm doing is not right. Mm -hmm. 
And that's good. Isn't that good? If you're, if you're doing something contrary to God, don't you want to know it? If somebody tells you and you become responsible, are you going to say that person is a bad person because they told me I was sinning? No. You've learned. Now you understand. Now you're responsible. The law is good because it tells me and it shows me that I can't do the right thing. I know, verse 18. Well, verse 17. Now then, it is no more I. It, I, I don't want to, I'm doing what I don't want to do and I'm not doing what I want to do. It's, it's no longer I that do it. But it's sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, my carnal man, I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. The will to do good is present there. I want to do what is righteousness. Somebody, Jake, would you close that door when you go out, please? That's beginning to distract me. Where was I? See, I told you I was distracted. For I know that in me, that's in my carnal man, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. I want to do good. That which I want to do, I don't do. That which I don't want to do, I, so I will to do good. It's present with me. But how to perform it? How to do the stuff that's good? I can't find it. I don't know how to do that. Why? Because the law is always there. I heard someone say today, I was watching a particular station, and they were giving praise to the blah, 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 blah person of the station. Appreciating and thanking them for teaching them about the Torah and how important it is in the Christian, in the believer's life. That's what I said. Hmm. Now, it was good. The Torah was good. It did what it was supposed to do. But we bring on that. It could only tell me I was a sinner. I, I wanted to do good. It, the will was there. But I didn't know how to perform it. Verse 19. For the good that I would do, uh, I do not... But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin. That present participle form to dwell, but it is sin that dwelleth in me. Remember the present participle form of a verb always speaks of a continuing action. The sin that dwells and just keeps dwelling in me. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it. It's the sin that dwells in me. Now he opens up by inference an illustration here. Almost metaphoric. Grammatically speaking. In that when you talk about dwelling, someone dwelling in a place or a thing dwelling in something, you are talking about a house. Where's your dwelling? Do I have to explain to you what that means? No. Uh, dwelling place means I live there. Hang on to that. That's important. I'm fixing to illustrate now, if I do that, I would not. It's not I that do it. It's the sin 
that has made me its dwelling place. There's nowhere else for it to go because I'm still under the law and the law tells me I'm a sinner. Therefore, I become the housing of the sin. I remember when I was a boy, and perhaps some of you will remember. I'm going to bring it up to date also. But I remember as a little boy, growing up back in Kansas, and we didn't have air conditioning. I didn't have air conditioning until I was a big boy. I had to move away from home to get air conditioning. So all the doors would be open and all the windows. And I would sit in our house in Kansas City, and I was amazed, I, I almost mesmerized, as I looked toward the front door or toward a window, and the light would be pouring in, but in the light, it was all these particles of junk. Dust. You know what I'm talking about? Have you, have you ever been amazed at that? To see all the stuff you breathe? And my mom, my, my sister and I, we were the two oldest, and, and before our, uh, the third, third came along, my brother, we were the house cleaners. Every Saturday we cleaned house. And we had assignments. Uh, Sandy would do this and this and this, and I would do this and this and that. And the one thing I always hated is when mom would say, Kenneth, really she said, Kenneth Lee. Kenneth Lee, I want you to go shake out the drugs. Now you kids don't even know what I'm talking about. You never shook out a rug, have you? Our old house was a tile floor. And Mama would throw down little rugs to keep it warm in the winter. A little bit comfortable. And every Saturday, somebody going to have to shake those rugs out. And I hated that. So I'd gather up all the rugs in all the rooms and I'd carry them out on, and I would, I would start shaking the dust out. How many of you ever done that? Yeah. You, you still do that? Most people just depend on the vacuum cleaner now. Yeah, you had the cat. But they'd send me up, and I hated that because it would just take your breath. You'd shake it like it, and you turn your head. And you'd shake it. And you had to do it until, and you come back in, and Sandy has been dust, dusting, put that in quotes. My sister had been dusting the furniture. That means getting the dust off the furniture. Well, that dust has got to go somewhere. It's just not on the furniture anymore. And she had dust off the windows, not come in. There's, there's that cloud in the, in the streaming sunlight. There was no way physically possible, there was no way humanly possible to get rid of the dust. You just had to deal with it. You could move it around, you could rearrange it, but you couldn't get rid of it. Ladies and gentlemen, that is sin. When people try to deal with their sin through human means, they're not getting rid of it. They're just moving it around. There is no way in, in, in creation to move sin out of the dwelling place of your life except by the cleansing power of Jesus Christ. Why do you still deal with the sin nature because the sin nature is in your housing. It is dwelling in you. Are, are you getting the picture? Sin dwells. I, I am the housing of that. It dwells in me, Paul said. 
I find then, verse 21, I find then a law. This is another law. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Do you know what a law is? It's a principle. I find then that there's a principle alive in me. It's always with me. Hmm. He said in verse 22, I delight. Now see, he is not bad now for law. He said it was perfect. It was good. It shows him a sinner. It makes him sinner. It was a good thing. I delight in that law because it shows me what I really am. But, verse 23, I see another law in my members. Warring against the good law of God. The law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. That sin that's dwelling in me. And it seems like he just comes to the end of his rope. Oh, wretched man that I am. What does... Use the same word. Word there is really miserable. Some of your newer translations will say that. Oh, miserable man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I am a living dead man, not dead to the law. I'm alive unto the law, but I'm, the sin makes me dead. How can I abide this? Is there any answer? I am miserable in this. I know I'm a sinner, but I can't do anything about it. This is not a rhetorical question. Because in verse 25, he gives us the answer. He doesn't have to stay there. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And there's a period there. And that throws people. They don't know how to, to read it uh, concurrent. Let me, let me show you what I mean. Oh, miserable man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Oh, Jesus shall deliver me. Thank God. See, he's dealing with the issues of law with those who are under the law and can't can't find a way out from under it. And he's placing himself in their position. And he's asking the questions that they are asking. How can I get out from under this? I, I was born in it. I'm a Jew. The law is good. Yes. Amen. It's perfect. Yes. Amen. But it only takes me so far. How do I deal with this? Thank God. Jesus. We are no different than the Jew under law. There's only one way from this house of sin. Jesus Christ. He's the answer. And we say with Paul, Thank God. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. The thought does not end there. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. What does the law do? It condemns us. It does nothing but say, you're a sinner, 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 you're a sinner. By the way, that's what religion does. 
But when you when you become as a dead man in Christ and as a living man in Christ, you are free from your first husband. The law. And in Jesus Christ, while the law condemns, Jesus does not condemn. I did not come to condemn the world, but through me, the world might be saved. He doesn't condemn sinners. They're already condemned. It's the old sin nature that causes the condemnation, but when you come to Christ, the sin nature dies, and with it, the condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. Comma. Is it possible? For a believer to be saved, but still walk after the flesh. Yep. Yep. Paul gives it in another place. They're called carnal Christians. It's almost an oxymoron. Yeah. But as Christians still walking in their flesh, still, still trying to satisfy the old carnal nature, while at the same time trying to be free from it. Boy, now you want to talk about wretchedness. Yeah. Miserableness. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, comma, those who are in Him who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you are a believer walking in condemnation for what you were, it's because you're not walking in the newness of Christ's life. I didn't say it, Paul did. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Capital S. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. I'm saved and I know that I am. I'm saved and I know that I am. I'm saved and I know that I am. I'm so glad I know that I am. I'm free, and I know that I am. I'm free, and I know that I am. I'm free, and I know that I am. I'm so glad I know that I am. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God, Sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. See, Christ doesn't call the law bad. God doesn't call the law bad. It was good. There was a righteousness in it. But it could not be fulfilled until Christ and fulfill it. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. And he goes on and talks about those who walk after the flesh, the mind of the flesh, those who walk after the Spirit, the mind of the Spirit. I think that I wanted to deal with this tonight. And there's, there's so much more. You can't 
The book of Romans is a powerful book. I've already expressed that. And it cannot be preached in one setting. Because it always leaves you with a question. Even when it ends with a period, you walk away with a question. You just got to keep going with it. But I wanted to deal with this tonight. Because I believe that there are a lot of Christians still dealing with condemnation of sin in their life. They're still dealing with sin issues because they have not come to grips with the fact that they are dead in Christ and therefore alive in Christ and if so then sin is dead in you. You are not a slave or a servant to sin any longer. Amen. I have met believer after believer after believer who after giving their lives to Christ cannot forget their past constantly condemning themselves because of what they did. Let me say it simply in the 20th and 21st century vernacular. Don't do that. Just don't do it. How do I not do it? I mean, here's a word. Put this in your vocabulary. Practice. Practice. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. How do you get through this condemning of, of the enemy in your life because of what you have done and where you have been? Blah, 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 blah. Practice. You dirty, rotten, scoundrel, sinner, you. Nope. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm a brand new creation. My wife in teaching piano said practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. <laughs> if you practice wrong, you do it wrong. That's right. That's right. If you succumb to the condemnation that the enemy is bringing to your life, you are practicing that. Therefore, it's becoming a permanent fixture in your life. And I'm saying to you, when he comes to bring condemnation, practice something else. Practice confessing to him that you're the righteousness of God in Christ. You're a new creature. You're dead to sin, alive in God. The law no longer has dominion over you. That is the law of sin. Hello? Now, I know that this is a difficult area for people to really get a handle on, but I'm talking to somebody in here who is dealing with that issue. How do I know that? Because God told me to teach on this. Mm -hmm. And when he tells me to teach on something, it's never without purpose. Mm -hmm. Excuse the old carnal expression, he's not blowing up your skirt. Mm -hmm. He's speaking to somebody here. Father, I just pray that the word will come alive. Even if I butchered it, Father, if I didn't do you justice in delivering this, forgive me. But the Spirit goes far beyond what I can do. And I would ask you, God, to send your Holy Spirit into the lives of these, the hearers, and cause them to understand with clarity what Paul was trying to describe and explain in our freedom from sin and the law via the man Jesus Christ. And that in Him, we are no longer condemned. Holy Spirit, take the word. Use it. I ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.